Plato said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. Actors, like many politicians, change costumes to suit the script. Daniel Craig wears a dinner jacket to the casino and very little when working with Monica Bellucci. In Brussels, the dark suit of a European commissioner looks pretty much like the dark suit of a corporate lobbyist. It could even be a case of buy one, get one free. Clearly where you have situations where people in highly influential and very powerful positions are able to exit those positions one day and then within a very short space of time find themselves in another position that could potentially, through the linkages they have, through the networks that they have, through the knowledge that they have gained from this public position, assist them and private enterprises, then that clearly raises many questions. The distinction between working as an advisor or as a lobbyist can be as thin as a fine pinstripe. One problem with lobbying is that by definition, it's a concept not always cut from the same cloth. It has different patterns. There's no clear definition of conflicts of interest and also no uh, definition of lobbying. And that is one of the reasons that so many of these problematic job moves get green lights and get the go ahead. So uh, it's really important to, to, to strengthen the code of conduct and get these definitions uh, in place. As European institutions slowly build a transparency framework, clearer definitions of lobby activity are needed. Otherwise, talk of public integrity and the honesty of senior officials looks much like the Emperor's new clothes. When the European Parliament got, got elected in 2014, there were 50% of MEPs that, that changed. So there's a high number of, of members of Parliament that need new jobs. Um, and we see that more and more of them stay in Brussels and uh, become lobbyists, they go into the corporate sector, sell their, their former access and contacts in, into the parliament. If people uh, own uh, knowledge because of their public interest mandate in Europe and then sell it to a much higher wage uh, to the private services and, uh, and the lobbyists, uh, then this is highly doubtful. And in some cases, through the revolving door you actually get a sort of bribery by deferral. It's something, while they're still in office, they're taking certain actions, they're maybe delaying a legislative file or they're putting forward a proposal, already thinking about when, when I have to leave office, I already do things with that uh, post-employment in mind. In its recently published report on revolving doors at the European Commission, Lobby Watchdog's Corporate Europe Observatory and Lobby Control take a strong view that one in three ex-commissioners go through their revolving doors into what they say are problematic new roles. The report examines cases such as ex-commissioner and now MEP Vivian Redding's positions on several boards, Nidhi Cruz's advisory position at Bank of America Merrill Lynch and former trade commissioner Carl de Hoogt's proposed board membership at Belgian telecoms giant Proximus. But boss of bosses Former Commission President José Manuel Barroso has notified the Commission of 22 new roles. Busy man. Lobbying means um, organized uh, representation of interests. And uh, if you were like, for instance, Sharon Bowles, the chair of, of, of ECON, responsible for all the reforms of financial services legislation in the Parliament, and then you move for regulatory affairs to the London Stock Exchange, that is clearly selling your good reputation you earned before in the institution to a vested interest. And, uh, and these sort of cases should be banned. Uh, did uh, José Manuel Barroso have a good reputation to sell when he left the Commission? Well, I would say uh, no, but he was still uh, valuable enough uh, and therefore also this puts Europe into disrespect. The 26 Barroso commissioners who left office in 2014 racked up a total of 115 post-commission roles between them. Of these 115, 96 have been formally authorised. 36 of these formally authorised roles were considered by the Commission's in-house ad hoc ethical committee. The ethics committee is essentially former friends and colleagues assessing your future. Exactly. The, the ad hoc ethical committee, as it's called, it's, it's not sufficiently independent. Uh, it should be composed of independent ethics uh, experts 
from the national level. There are enough of those working in national governments, uh, agencies and so on. So it's really possible. We contacted several of the former commissioners noted in the CEO report, asking them how lobby transparency could be improved. At the time of broadcast, none had replied. When a commissioner leaves, he remains bound by his duties of integrity as when he is actually a commissioner. That will never change during his entire life, by the way. Uh, moreover, there is a period of 18 months where he's not allowed to lobby uh, his services, his former services, on issues that are related to, to his portfolio. Uh, in which case, by the way, uh, if he wants to do that, he needs to not only inform us, but we will then also consult a, uh, an ethical committee that will give us an opinion. Can we trust our officials, elected and unelected, not to make personal gain from their influence on tobacco legislation, diesel car emissions, regulation of financial markets, energy markets, trade policy, Europe's strategy towards Russia? When you have allegations, for instance, of Russian money finding its way into EU institutions, that is particularly serious. And I do not believe that our president is sufficiently empowered to be able to deal with those circumstances, and that needs to be addressed. Is the president sufficiently impartial in the same regard? Well, this particular function requires him to be, because it is actually a semi-judicial function uh, that he is carrying out. The European Commission gets a lot of bad press when it comes to investigating the rights and wrongs of commissioners' new jobs, but how does the Commission compare with the Parliament? For members of Parliament, the day they leave office, they are free to do whatever they want, no restrictions, no rules, and no transparency. We don't even know what, what they do. We in the Commission, we normally refrain from criticising other institutions, uh, but I think everybody would benefit from uh, our very uh, um, elaborate transparency system to be pushed out and rolled out to everybody else. Well, to be fair to the European Commission, they have brought in a system and commissioners have to seek authorisation uh, before taking up other positions, even after they've left the Commission. And that, that's a good thing. Uh, the question now is, is it being applied correctly? Is it uh, being interpreted in a sufficiently robust way? What are the greatest risks to a fair parliamentary process? And does the President of the European Parliament enjoy too much quasi-judicial power when it comes to the questionable ethics of European deputies? The President of the Parliament will be more likely to think about the political impacts uh, of, of, of really enforcing uh, the Code of Conduct and preventing conflicts of interest and, and then choose to, be, uh, to, to take it easy with, with these cases that we know do exist and are, are quite serious. There has not been a single sanction, uh, no MEP has ever been convicted, so to speak, for, for violating the Code of Conduct, despite manifest indications that that has been the case. Parliament, of course, cannot undo the results of the election. You can't actually throw a member out of Parliament. But what you can do, and we, we have provision for that, is to say that um, a member who has transgressed may not hold any internal office in the Parliament, may not be chair of a parliamentary committee, for instance. Uh, there are al also measures for fining MEPs, but it's only up to, I think, €1,500. Transparency International is leading the way with a new generation of tech tools designed to scrutinise lobbying in Brussels. With their interactive database website, Integrity Watch, anyone can create a unique overview of the European Commission's lobby meetings since December 2014. As more data becomes available, trends, timing of meetings and outcomes will be more effectively interrogated. Online tools like this cannot tell you what was said at a meeting or a cocktail party, but they do get one step closer to a formal level of accountability and they clarify questions and relationships which might otherwise have gone unnoticed. Unfortunately, what we have seen in the past, it often takes a scandal to make the Parliament move. Uh, we had the Cash for Amendments scandal with four MEPs being filmed uh, by other undercover journalists taking, accepting bribes to submit amendments. That triggered uh, the current regime that we have now. It introduced a Code of Conduct and the Ethics Committee. And we're fearing that it take, will take another scandal to, to get substantial reform. Politicians caught in revolving doors may seem like an accident waiting to happen, but when there is an abuse of public authority, we all suffer. It's not just about former public officials having privileged access to the decision-making process, it's about public confidence in the political process, in democracy. Plato also said, when men speak ill of thee, live so as nobody may believe them. 
So when the commercial activity of MEPs and commission officials is magnified in public view, they must be honest and be seen to be honest. Whichever roles commissioners and MEPs find to play, whichever doors they enter or exit, stage left or stage right, they should follow Plato's advice and never be afraid of the light.